then off we go. Okay. So first I'd like to thank you guys for the opportunity to present this. Now, with my background, I have taken artificial intelligence and neural networks, Sorry. of course. Uh, I have played with NCOP, which is a library. I have played with uh, Octave, which is like a math lab a bit. You've got to actually do the math and all that. And then I found this, probably like a month and a half ago. And there's something in it, so I wanted to play with it. So this is me playing with it, basically. So I did a little presentation, because I don't know where everyone is on uh, artificial intelligence and so forth. So. There's three types of artificial intelligence. Two, according to some people. You got the weak AI, which is basically where we are right now. It's where the computer itself can only focus on one single task. The task that I'm going to be showing you guys today is going to be dealing with the MNIST data set, which is basically a whole bunch of images of written numbers. It's a 28 by 28 pixel uh, block. And it's handwritten, just so writing two numbers, zero through nine. So that's what we're going to be doing with today. And it's supervised learning, and that's the slide. So the next step will be uh, a strong AI, which is basically an AI that can take multiple factors into its decision making, kind of like how humans make do. Like when we walk down the street, we see things coming our way, we'll naturally react. Our single task is walking forward, but we can comprehend different things coming at, at us and stuff and make decisions off that. And then that is said to skyrocket after AI hits that point and it's going to shoot to singularity, which is super intelligence. Everyone jokes about Skynet. Basically, that. <laughs> so, artificial intelligence and machine learning is not the exact same thing. Machine learning is a category of artificial intelligence, and that's what TensorFlow is. So, basically machine learning, as defined here, machine learning is a subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, as in it can teach itself. It is from the study of pattern recognition of computational learning theory and artificial intelligence, studying of the design and analysis of machine learning algorithms. So, we got three different types of learnings. We got supervised learning, which I'm going to demonstrate today. Supervised learning, I think the data set is about 55,000 records. It's going to split this into different sets. 70% of it will be, it's going to create the model for us. 20% will be the training. And then 10% is the test. So, we're going to create the model itself, and then we're going to train it to be as accurate as possible. And then we're going to test it with the 10% of the 55,000 records. Unsupervised learning is where we don't know the answer. So we know the answer here, and we're teaching the model unsupervised. Unsupervised, we have no idea what the answer is. And that plays a big role in data mining. And an easy way to do that, let's say you have a graph like such. And then you have the data plugins everywhere. A common algorithm that's just for unsupervised learning is trying to find a group of characteristics that group together to per se. A common one is k-means algorithm. k is the number of nodes or clutters you want to find. So we've got two nodes here. Pull the median line between the two, and then all these on this line belongs to this node. It's going to travel to the middle of all its data. This is going to travel to the middle of all its data. Then it's going to reevaluate the line, like so. Continue forth, forth, forth until the node doesn't move. And that's your groups. The K itself can be as many groups as you want. Be two, three, four, yada, yada, all the way up to what you believe. And reinforced learning, this is basically machines that play video games against people. I mean, the most common one was the Go player. I heard from my professor at the time when I was in AI that there's more moves in Go than known atoms in the known universe. So that was a really strong neural network. From what I remember, it was a pretty dumbed down one to make a quicker decision, which the neural network I'll show you is kind of slow. <laughs> so yeah, I've already explained data mining. I'm supervising learning. Uh, machine learning in data mining is known as knowledge discovery in databases. It's basically trying to find patterns and a mess load of data, see if we can figure out patterns. Okay, so. The algorithm I'm going to use during this demonstration is going to use gradient descent, and the neural network will use back. 
that propagation algorithm. Gradient descent is basically the next step. So if you have a graph like such, it's sine function of x uh, plus cosine of g of x, say that. So the graph is going to kind of look like flowy like this, and then kind of like so. And from a side view, kind of see like a plane that kind of goes like this. So gradient descent, you drop point anywhere. It will naturally take little tiny steps until it finds the bottom. In calculus, you do this with taking the derivative equal to zero, you find the maximum, minimum, and so forth. Gradient descent is with this. The most basic thing I can show you with gradient descent, that's the formula we're going to use, by the way, with a small gamma that will slowly take small steps towards the bottom. And the bottom is the error of the machine. That means to say. <laughs> so we're going to use gradient descent to lower the error. This is a common one used, uh, this is a very simple one used in Python. You got the current step, six, gamma, which needs to be small, take small steps, because you can overstep in machine learning. So if you're back to this graph, and you overstep, you just jump here, and you jump here, jump here, so forth, and then there's also errors. This dip can be lower than this dip. So if this starts here and drops down that way, that's going to cause the, the model itself be not as accurate. That's why we use neural networks. So this one is using 4x cubed minus 9x squared, which is something like this. So the highest power itself tells you if it's squiggly or if it's parabola. It's odd, so it's squiggly. So basically all this one is doing is exactly like that. It's moving this here, going down to there. So that's the gradient this time we'll be using. Okay, neural networks and deep learning. Now this one is a little bit more complicated. <laughs> so <laughs> the learning here, uh, it's basically designed off of the human neuron. So you have the brain, has a neuron, little cell, and they have these little branches that build out and start connecting, like so forth. It's different patterns. Sends your electrical pulse, goes to the part of memory that needs to be addressed. Neural networks is designed after that. It's a little bit more complicated. When I show, when we go to the neural networks, when I'm actually building it, I'll show you exactly what it's going to look like. Um, let's see. Yeah, something like that. Deep learning is when, so you have an input layer into. Uh, uh, neural network, and then you have an output layer. In between are hidden layers. Depending on how you design your neural network, because there's plenty of ways to design it, there's many different structures you can use. TensorFlow has many different ones you can pray, practice with, play along with. I'm doing the most basic one. But if it has hidden layers, it's considered deep learning. That's the difference between it. Okay? Now, these are the equations that are dealt with back propagation algorithm. So the first thing you need to decide when you start machine learning is the cost function. The top one is the cost function. A is the node that you're at, L is the layer, J is the number of node down on that layer. You've got the gamma, or sorry, sigma, which needs to be small, then you've got summation of the weight matrix as a layer of the J node going to the K node. So let's say this is your middle one. This is your node, this is the J. So this is uh, layer one, J1, going to K1. Now every neuron will go to every single neuron on the next layer and so forth until it comes to the end and goes to the output, this is your answer. So that cost function uh, differs depending on how you model it. We're doing a pretty basic one. The second one is equation of the error of the output layer. So it's going to measure the error going from here to here, which is delta layer, the J node. Uh, I explained these other ones on the other slides. Then the one afterwards is the error going backwards, back propagation. The next one changes the bias, which every layer has a bias, which I like to you know, doesn't connect to them all. This bias does not connect to the layer before, but does connect to the layer after. Bias is kind of like maneuver. And the last one changes the weight matrix accordingly. Every single neuron has a weight matrix associated with it. So this is the first one, the one error going forward. The first 
little bit of information. This right here is measuring the rate of change of error from that given node. And the second one, uh, sigma prime is uh, z of L of J. That is their whole entire cost function summarized. That will do that. This is the same exact thing, different formula, but it goes backwards. Um, this changes the bias figure according to delta L of J, which we know from the previous function. And this one changes the weight of the function using the node from the one before, the k times, how many times it connects. k is how many it connects, so one, two, three, four, that's all k. And then uh, delta L of J, which is our next one. Okay, so this is a step of back propagation algorithm. You got the input, which feeds in, and then you use a feed forward, which uses the first formula I show you, and pushes all the errors towards the end. And they got back propagation with the opposite, because at the end, neural networks have been around for a long time. It's just until we discovered backwards propagation where it actually became useful. Because if we know the answer in supervised learning, we can measure the actual answer outcome that we get compared to the actual answer, adjust the error, move it back. And then, let's see, change the bias, change the weight. The weight will be changed using gradient descent, the weight matrix. Okay, so TensorFlow. So this is the basics of tensors. This is all you really need to know to play around with it. So tensors are random dimensions. So the first one is rank one, which is one dimensional, and it has shape three. The second one is like a two dimensional, two by three, and then so forth. And then you just square back it, so forth. Sessions invoke the run method on your AI. Placeholders is like, hold the function mx plus b, everyone knows that one. Uh, placeholder is the x, where you put in different values and it continues to run the equation. Variables, is basically what needs to be changed in the machine learning. So that would be our weight matrix and our bias. There's that. So we're gonna look at the actual videos now. Do you guys mind if I jump ahead because I'm a slow programmer? No worries. Okay, so TensorFlow, you need to download. I use Anaconda. Anaconda, you're gonna need down TensorFlow, and you need Python, depending on if you're using for your own fun like I did, it was 3.5.2. Uh, Amazon Web Services, it's 2.7. So this is where I added PowerPoint, that's where I needed to crop it. So we'll just start cropping this. So this is me pulling the data, which is the MNIST data, which is the 28 by 28 pictures of people writing numbers 0 through 9. It's going to impulse. Sorry, this is all from command prompt. There's probably a better way to do this, but too lazy to find out, I just wanted to play around with it. Okay, so we're gonna assign all the data. Can you guys read that? I will. <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> okay, so right now all I'm doing is pulling the data to this variable, which is MNIST. I don't know what that stands for, just, I guess an acronym. Okay, that's, I'm importing TensorFlow right now. And then I'm assigning a placeholder to use for X. It's somewhat readable. Uh, I'm gonna run out of space. So, yeah, so the placeholder right there, I don't know how, I'm using a, a tensor to, as my variable, I don't know how many records are going to go into it because it's split 70, 20, 10, so I have no idea. So when you use none, that is associated to any number you want to load into it. 784 is 28 plus 28. So that's me sent the weight matrix to a variable that's going to change, which is 784, which will pull all those pixels of the picture, bring it into a vector, and then <coughs> push out to a 10. The reason why it's 10, so we're going to set a vector. Here is index 0 through 9. Whatever is 1 is the answer at the end of the machine. Softmax is to balance the equation out, basically. So all the odds and errors, like if there's a negative number, I'll take it rid of it, make it all equal 100. And that's the answer from.
from the data itself. Which I'm going to set, if I remember right, none and then no, 10 categories. So cross entropy, this is going to be an equation that is used to compare the answer with the probability guess I use. The summation, I can't tell what it is, log of y prime, then log of y, I think. So, and then we're going to, this is going to be the training step, it's going to train the actual model itself. Uh, TensorFlow has the method itself trained, and then all that stuff I showed you with gradient sand, with all that math, you don't have to worry about it, it has its own method to do it for you. 0 0.05, or 0 0.5, is how many steps were taken with each iteration. And then we're going to minimize the errors, which is across the entropy. And then set a session. Session basically hits a run method, and then in the background it's going to run all the C and C++ code. If I remember right, numpy is like that too. And then you got initialized variables with TensorFlow. And then this is just a for each, running through all the data. And we're gonna run the session, run it with the train session, and feed dictionary, that's what's going to throw in my placeholders. So it's gonna put in all the x values and all the solutions that I got from the data. And then we're going to check the, uh, the prediction, see if it's correct. And then the accuracy, which our max just checks what value is in the vector, see which one's closest to one. And then cast it, mean, that just guesses the accuracy. And we're going to print it. Feed dictionary is going to run through all the 10% uh, test. And then, there you go. The machine itself was 91.97, so 92% crap, which is kind of embarrassing for machine learning, to be honest. So, with that being done, we want to change that. We're going to change it to a neural network and try to up it a bit. There's going to be a lot of this what I'm going to skip, because a lot of it is just building the neural network. So we got four functions here. Oh, yeah, go ahead. The first one is defining the weight variables. We need to create a function for itself because there's multiple nodes and we need to use multiple weight matrices. The second one is set creating the bias figure. The third one is a convolution, I think it's called. But basically what a convolution does is when you combine two functions together, it just makes it combine. So yeah, convolution equals like the integral of f of x plus the integral of g of x. And then if you know the integral, it's just finding the area underneath the graph itself. So when these two combine, it's going to fill in that area where they combine. Yeah? So just, just a question. I mean, you're, you're looking at a data set that's a bunch of written numbers, handwritten numbers. Um, you know, when I think of solving this, you know, I would think of maybe vectorizing it and looking at, you know, okay, I'm looking for this curve and this distinct thing. What kind of thing is this, is the machine learning looking at? Sorry, say that again? Well, what is the machine learning itself, do you? I, I mean, how does it, you got a two and a three, what is it looking at between the two and the three? What is it comparing? What do you mean the two and the three, sorry? Third, so, so you've got, You've got your data set, and from one item in the data set to the next item in the data set, what would it be comparing to figure out oh. how to classify it? So we're going to draw the neural network. So the neural network that I'm programming right now on the screen looks like this. So you have the input layer, which is a one, which is the image itself, which is 28 by 28. This is going to shoot off to 32 of these which is, in my opinion, badly designed, but whatever. And then you're going to have a bias right here, which is going to adjust it. Then this is going to shoot off to 64 of these things. And then it's going to have the bias. 
1024 goes to 1024. This is what makes a neural network go so slow. And you've got bias, and then it's going to shoot to the answer of 10 nodes. And this, of course, is the vector we're working with. This is 0 through 9. Whatever which one is the closest probability to 100% is your answer for it. So, you then put the image itself. Use the, it's going to use uh, logistical regression, which is going to, in a simple sense, in a two dimensional plot, you have all these. Actually, we can do this. So, you have nine numbers, right? So, it's finding certain patterns like six. It has a uh, white over here, and then it's white over here, but it can be confused with, let's say, eight. Because it knows this loop, um, it's going to guess this and this. It's going to bring up the probability of which one it is at the end. Then um, it's going to, it's like we have supervised learning, we're going to have the y set, y underscore, which is the actual answers of this. And that's going to be compared to this, know the error right here, and back propagate and adjust all these weighted matrices and biases to work with it. Now, how these certain weight matrices are actually getting that is from the previous function before described on back propagation. So I'm going to measure the error from here. Going this way, which is feed forward, and then back forward. It's going to adjust these weights according. It's going to move the matrix around. That's what TensorFlow is doing for us. And then next time it goes in, oh, it's also using a convergent, which is moving this pixel smaller and smaller. Cuts it in half, then it cuts it in half. So it's going to go through that, use linear logistical regression. It's going to use a softmax, and then at the end it's going to use a dropout, which is um, overfitting a, a machine. An overfitting machine is where you get too correct on the logistical regression, where it actually will shoot. But an example is this. So let's say you have all these plots right here, and all these right here, and let's say your machine knows there's a difference between here. Let's say you have logical error right here. If you overfit, the model will come up here, do this. And that's not what we want. There is actual error in data that you need to account for. So, sorry, am I going the right way with your question? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm trying to... It's really complex math. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, it's, it's looking at it comparing areas of the image. Yeah. And saying that, so each, each one of those layers could be, I expect this area of the image to be brighter and this area to be darker, this percentage of the time, and depending on that percentage, that it's going to detect, that it's going to change the decision that's made. Those images are bitonal though, right? Like, they're on or off, it's not a gradient or a color, right? Uh, the inputs? The inputs itself is just like black and white pictures that are just right. drawn white pictures, and then, I think what I'm <coughs> trying to say, so let's say you got the pixels, and it brings down the padding to an actual location on the image, adds up all those colors, sends it the weight to the next one. If it's small, it's not going to really care and consider that path. So the smaller the weight, the least this will make an answer towards the end. And then it will add those numbers from the square boxes of the paddings of the image. Let's say it's 0, 0 0.0001, and the colors, say 1, 0. And it's like boxing this like such, and then it's evaluating all the inputs of the colors and so forth, moving it through this neural network, and then when it comes to the end, there's going to be a heavier weight from, let's say, this one to this one because of the path it traveled, adjusting the weights, it will come sooner or later to here, being the strongest point, this vector will come from zero, let's say zero, 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 and then it will be like 9.98 and zero point two then I'll know from this node that it's correct. Then I'll compare it with the actual answer itself, see if it's correct, if it's correct, and how off it is, it's 0.98, so it's 0.02. Move that through the algorithm back. Seeing that node was actually correct, it will do little impact upon that, but all the other nodes that can do it, it'll lower that number. So it wouldn't matter when it's compared to that matrix. Okay. Sorry, that's really hard to explain. Well, so, so, so basically, when oh. it, it goes through a path of nodes, and it strengthens nodes, 
that appear to be working correctly. Strengthens the weight matrix associated with the node. So if right. we go back to like so it strengthens uh, the weight of that mm -hmm. that decision making factor. Mm -hmm. Weakens the other decision making factors because it knows that it's got a correct answer. Yeah. So it's pulling this whole image, which is set to four pixels, and it's compressing it down to a single vector in TensorFlow, and it's compressing that. Let's say uh, it gathers like certain pixels all together and bunches in that nodes to a ten vector. And that you can start doing linear algebra okay. and it fits the actual equation, moves forward. And now according to how that matrix is formed, they may change that according to what those numbers are. Sorry. <laughs> That's really hard not. Okay. I have another question. Yeah. Um, and this is more along the lines of the data. So within those images in there, mm -hmm. are the numbers all identical or are they across the board? They're all 28 by 28 pixels. The numbers are completely different because they're 784 pixels and we're compression low to be. Those images throughout the neural network as we push all the way towards the end. So a so six won't look like it's necessarily look like a six in another image. image. Yeah, as in like they're hand drawn by humans, as in like no one draws a perfect six all okay. the time. So these are handwritten? Yes. Every single data is handwritten in this. So right here in TensorFlow, all I'm doing is actually building this neural network. That's all it's doing. Creating the weights, creating the um, bias, and then creating the logistical regression, that the function itself that goes at each node to progress. Then, yeah, that's basically all this coding is right here. And this goes on for a bit. Can you guys see that yet? Yeah. No. That's literally the bottom line. <laughs> can't go further than that. So, uh, let me just fast forward and I'll explain it to you what's going on. So, this ending one is creating the uh, final functions, which is the dropout, preventing. Uh, TensorFlow does that for you. It has its own method to do the dropout and do the softmax for you, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about all the math. All you have to do in TensorFlow is create the tensors. That's it. Create the tensors, connect them, you're good. So you're saying that they have all the libraries for dealing with the, the images? What if you want to do, you want to do some machine learning with sound or, um, or just words? Yeah. Words out or that one I haven't got into yet. I'm still designing neural networks, different forms of it. But yeah, you can do sound. You can do spam filtering. You can do, what else is there? Uh, I'm asking because I'm asking you just. This one right now is. It seems like it is dealing with the images itself. You don't even have to deal with. Um, yeah. Breaking up the, the images into, nah. um, so, into areas. And what I'm wondering is, um, do you have libraries and stuff for, mm -hmm. for sound? Absolutely. Okay. If you... Yeah. Well, of course, you're running from Python, so whatever you can fit into a matrix that your neural network fits, you should be able to do with some library in Python. Oh, I have no internet connection. Hold on. Let's see if I can get this going. Simic building, right? So, and what was in my de demonstration is actually the hard library. If you actually look through the API and go to tf.contrib, that makes it even easier for the user to use. Yeah, I'm not getting internet. But basically, you can just go to the website and, oh wait, yeah, I do. And it'll show you the API and there's so many things. When I built this, it was 1.0 version, which tells you how early it is. And it's at 1.2, they released not too long ago. The stable one's 1.1. This is the easy library right here. Contrib, you got Bayes, you got different graphs you can build, you got cloud, frameworks, image. See, there's the image one. It's just got 
different use for everything. So all you need to do is TensorFlow takes care of all this for you, all the complicated math, all the connections, and just does it with tensors. And let's see, you guys can't probably see my, the machine learning literally, the neural network froze my computer for like 30 minutes. <laughs> so I did 20,000 steps, but the prediction came out to be 99.4% in the end. That's basically all I got. <laughs> So I heard that uh, TensorFlow can send that your, your um, machine learning uh, calculations to the GPU? Yes. You have two different... Uh, I didn't mine on the CPU because okay. on the GPU you need a NVIDIA and my desktop has an AMD. Uh, so <laughs> that I could have... Is that because it's using CUDA? Huh? Is that because it's using CUDA? I, I, you could either use uh, CUDA or I think... Just basic PIB, you use that too. Which I think CUDA comes with, doesn't it? I don't know. Do you have to do anything special to send to the GPU? Or? I, I haven't played with the GPU, I've only done CPU. It maxed my CPU at like, I think Python was taking 94% of the resources when I was running through the neural network. <clears throat> so I just had to wait. Do you suppose that binding to a faster, like Python is slow? Unless you use, like you said, if you're using NumPy or SciPy with uh, the, those functions are in C, so those are fast. Yeah. But between lines, it's slow. Do you think binding to another language would reduce that, or are you just primarily waiting for calls to return? Um, I, I think most machine learning is done through C and C++. Almost everything. This is just a library that, you, there's different libraries on the website too to use C++ only and C. It's just your preference. I just started at Python. Yeah. Just what are substantially faster. Really yeah. uh, what else can you do to scale it? If, for example, I had 10 nodes on it, you know, if I've got five little laptops sitting at home and I were to you know, <laughs> um, build, a, build a cluster of supercomputer out of that, that'd be, pie style. That'd be cool if you what, do that, please. You know, so. Can you do that or yeah. is, it, is it better to put it in a single cloud instance to do this or? I honestly think if, if you join them, it'd be greater, but I haven't played with it. I don't know. I could, maybe it's on the fact page. I can look that up and send it to you. Well, I can look that up. <laughs> and you had a question? Yeah, we need a multi-building neural network. How do you store it? Store it? Like to reuse it again later. Okay. So neural networks, you originally start with the model, builds the model, trains the model to be 100% correct. So I guess you just have to run the program again. I've never heard of storing it. Well, it's just, well you can do a trained model. You save your trained model for later on. Your trained model? Yeah, it was MS. Lists, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can just dump that to disk. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when originally when I started the program, I uploaded all the data to a certain thing, and they had different, the object itself, MS.model, then it had label, image, so forth. But yeah, right there. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So did you test it? Did you say that and I didn't hear you? Did you write out? Yeah, yeah, I did wrong? test it. It froze my computer for like half an hour. It was 99.4% correct. And you got that in the video, right? Yeah, I got it on video. I just can't get it to work on that. Hold on. Maybe I could pull it up and you guys can see it. It's the very last video. Do you want to send me those videos? These are all the stats it went through. This one's 98%, one, 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 And then, oh, right there, I think. Oh, yeah, that's just me pointing around with stuff. Okay, this is printing the accuracy. Feed dictionary, which is putting in all the placeholders from the test images and the test labels. Okay. And then, there's me just pulling a stupid move. It is... Right there. Oh, 99.3. <laughs> Sorry, I lied. But those are all the different steps I went through, and that's the end of my training model up there. Okay. Super cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>